Okay, so last week we started looking at uh, work ROVs that are used, and these are usually huge beasts that we talked about. They can easily be the size of a, a, a dining table and uh, weigh uh, a couple of tons. So, so uh, and then uh, in addition, you can usually also strap a grip to it so that it can weigh even more. So they, they usually look something like this, basically a box shape because they're not made for, for speed or ease of movement. Basically, they have usually uh, quite powerful thrusters to keep them in place while they're working so that they can, uh, can, handle, the, uh, uh, can handle the ocean currents uh, and everything. But, but they still have limitations on, on ocean currents. So um, if, you get, if you get too much currents in an area, you won't be able to, to do much with your ROV. It's basically going to use most of its power in just staying in place. So it's uh, not going to have much, much left over. Um, yeah. So I think we looked a bit at this one uh, last week, and we also started looking at different examples of ROV tools. We had cutting and torque tools for uh, for pulling and uh, connection, and connecting of cables and pipes, like the Icarus one. We we looked at in one of the appendixes, and also for replacing components and smaller modules on uh, subsea production systems. I think the last thing we talked about was uh, the, uh, that we were able to actually uh, hook up a skid, what is called a skid, on the uh, underside of, uh, of a work ROV usually, where you can uh, have specialty equipment inside the, built into the skid, and then you connect it to the ROV so that the ROV is sort of moving it around and you can do oil samples and uh, quite a lot of different stuff you know, with uh, different kinds of skids. Uh, here is just an illustration to show that you can pick up objects that you've lost uh, or just debris that you find uh, out there. It's uh, quite amazing, anything you that you can find. Quite, quite, no, quite deep waters also. Which it doesn't make sense that anyone has actually thrown it overboard while they were passing up top on the surface vessel. So most likely it's ocean currents that have, that have uh, uh, basically just over time moved the objects uh, into the area. So that is usually some of the, the work that, uh, that is done uh, while the, uh, the ROVs are done uh, by the ocean floor. So they often do, do uh, just pick up debris that's that possibly might be in the way or that might be picked up by ocean currents and actually uh, be placed in close enough proximity to, to the subsea structure that it might actually interfere with, with sacrificial animals and stuff. Especially like a shopping basket that's been moved out there. It's made out of metal. And if that one is moved with ocean currents until it actually touches bare metal on, uh, on the subsea structure, it's going to interfere with the, uh, with the uh, electrical conductivity. Uh, there and you're going to get uh, get unexpected results on your sacrificial animals. So they basically they're going to they're going to start protecting the shopping basket as well, and, and that's not something you want. So um, that's one of the tasks. Another task is uh, just basic cleaning, uh, because uh, as soon as you have have a light that reaches down, so down to about 100 meters, there is going to be quite a lot of growth uh, on stuff. Uh, and when you get below 100 meters, you don't get you don't get this bacterial growth or algae growth uh, on exactly on your structures, but you will still have uh, quite a lot of uh, debris and sediment and stuff that have settled onto your onto your equipment that you need to brush off if you're going to be able to visually inspect it or even connect something. Like in this case, they're going to connect a, a uh, Christmas tree on top here, and then they have to make sure that all of the dirt uh, has been removed so that nothing is going to interfere with the ceiling uh, of, uh, of the Christmas tree to the wellhead. <coughs> and uh, other tasks is, uh, like in this case, the ROV is placing a ceiling ring inside the wellhead before, before the uh, Christmas tree is lowered down and connected. So first off, he, uh, he uh, clean the area and then he places the, the uh, ceiling ring uh, in the correct location. And then it's actually connecting the guide wires to, to the guide posts so that they can uh, use a running tool to, to uh, put the Christmas tree down. And then we have a couple of other 
options of uh, tools. So a typical torque tool is usually mounted up front. It is often, doesn't really show that well in this illustration, but it is usually held by the manipulator uh, on, a, on a ROV handle. So that it's holding the uh, torque tool in place so that you can move it a bit around. And you also have uh, the, uh, on the torque tool itself. So if we sort of blow up this little detail here, it will look more like this. And you can see that on the sides here, there's an indentation. So, so we have a sort of slot uh, that can be used. And on, on the spindle side, where we have a nut that's going to be tightened or loosened, there are also uh, taps that will fit inside those slots. So that once the ROV places the torque tool onto, uh, onto the spindle here, where it's going to, to tighten or loosen, these slots will interact with the taps on the sides there, and the outer casing of the torque tool is going to be kept in place so that it can't rotate. So it's going to be locked into place by these taps and slots that are interfacing with each other. Then the outer casing can rotate, so all the ROV has to do is just to make sure that they remain in contact, so it just has to hold, hold it there. It doesn't have to doesn't have to use any of its hydraulic power in the manipulator arm to counteract the rotating motion. Because that would be very hard because not only would that rotating motion move through the manipulator arm, it move, would move into the ROV itself and then suddenly the thrusters would have to counteract a rotating motion or else the entire ROV would just go in a circle. Unless it was uh, keeping a hold of the structure with the other manipulator. So that's a, it's a good way of uh, counteracting quite a lot of torque, which means that you can have very powerful torque tools. So it can deliver a, a high amounts of torque uh, to, to a lot, uh, in order to loosen or tighten it. Now we have a um, short clip. Well, it's a, really a long clip, but I'm going to show just parts of it. So first off is... Thank you. 
work done at 3,000 meters. things that need to come into consideration. Both when you're designing a system like this, if that is your work, if you're working as a mechanical engineer, doing a, a designing work on it, you need to keep in mind what it can actually end up being exposed to uh, with regards to forces and everything. Uh, but also if you end up being more of a, a field engineer that you're actually on board a ship like this, a, a vessel where you are doing lifting stuff and uh, moving it around. So, so it's uh, very important to know that uh, uh, very easy to damage stuff and uh, and, uh, and uh, damage people also. So it's uh, you need to be very safety aware when you're know, working with this stuff. So we have one more plate, actually. Um, This is a clip of one of those crawlers that's moving on the ocean floor. Tracking machine built by SMD to a market leading specification. The bespoke modular design and debt transfer system enables jetting and cutting mode changes to take place at sea, saving valuable vessel time and significantly reducing project cost. 
The integrated launch system incorporates a deployable cursor, a heat-verting mechanism preventing umbilical snatch loading through the splash zone. It's basically the size of a crunch, so it's really large. In chain cutting mode, dual grabs are used to load the product into the central support assembly which accepts product anomalies up to 250 millimeters in diameter. The product is then retained by the depressor, bell mouth, and side guard. Irrespective of trench backfill. <coughs> In chain cutting mode, a trench depth of up to two meters can be achieved. A high volume trench pump ensures spoil is transported away from the trench or path. Uh, 
scanner just to get. Uh, I'm not sure if you know about the Doppler effect, any of you? It's like when you hear a car, and, uh, if you hear uh, an ambulance driving past you, the siren car. When it's coming from far off, you hear the uh, siren coming at a certain frequency. So you, you hear the, the siren coming, and then as it passes you and continues on, you hear the siren changes, the sound is changing. That's because <coughs> the sound from the siren is moving towards you with the ambulance as it's coming towards you, and then it changes as it moves away, because then the sound of the siren is still moving away from you, but in, uh, at a different... Uh, the sound of the siren is still moving towards you, because that's of course being broadcast in a circle, so it's going everywhere uh, around uh, the ambulance, but now the ambulance is moving away from you, so the relative speed of the sound has been changed. So instead of being the speed of sound, plus the velocity of the uh, ambulance coming towards you. It is now the speed of sound minus the velocity of the, uh, the uh, ambulance that's going away from me. So now the sound uh, has suddenly changed there. So it's a way, basically, of being able to calculate velocities uh, for stuff. That is also what they do uh, when they're looking uh, in their... Uh, uh, looking in the... Uh, Kepler uh, telescope and stuff like that, looking at far distant galaxies. And the reason they know that galaxies are moving away from each other right now is that the, uh, the light that they're seeing from these distant galaxies is red. And if it's red, it's moving uh, at a certain speed. And that's uh, because it seems like it's red towards us, it's shifted towards the red part of the spectrum. It means that it's moving away from us. So it would have been shifted towards the blue part of the spectrum was coming towards us. I think it's the blue, but don't take my word for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it's the same, the same effect. So, so you get it not only in sound, but, but you do get it with light and, and everything else. So you will have an effect when, when uh, stuff is moving relative to each other. So that's basically what the Doppler is doing. So it's uh, keeping a track of uh, velocities uh, around here. Uh, there's often camera booths. There can be more than one. Uh, usually there's one on each side, and there might even be one up top, just to get a, a more, more of an overview. I've seen that in some, uh, some cases. And basically the whole point with the camera boom is just to have a camera attached to the end, and get it moved out to the side. Because if you're moving, let's say, uh, one meter above a pipeline, moving across it, if you have a camera that's looking straight down, you're just going to see the top of the pipeline. So you're basically just going to see 180 degrees of the pipeline. You're not going to see the sides of it. But if you have cameras placed on your booms, then you can suddenly manage more around 270 degrees uh, of, of the pipe. So basically the only part of the pipe that you're not seeing is what's facing down towards the ocean floor. Uh, so that's more for the visual uh, inspection part. Uh, it's us usually there are sensor frames everywhere with sensors uh, connected to them. Uh, they're more of uh, fairly similar to, to, to the the projects uh, that you're doing in the, in the mechanical design right now, where you are basically creating, many of you are using uh, uh, using vacuum or magnets in order to, to be able to lift your object, and then basically your job is to create the framework for, for these uh, components that you're going to buy. Uh, and that's the same here, so, so for, a, for a mechanical engineer, uh, the job here would be to create the framework where the sensors are being at the front, there is a pipe tracker. You can also see this crawler used a pipe tracker, so it can move this one into the front uh, to begin with. Uh, that was uh, when it was starting using these water jets. Because as soon as it started using the water jets, it wasn't holding on to the cable anymore. So it wasn't moving the cable uh, as it moved along. It was just moving on top of the cable instead. But then they used these uh, pipe trackers, which are basically just uh, electromagnets. So they are just reading uh, uh, readings of the uh, electromagnetic field from the Earth, and since pipelines usually are made of steel, then you uh, will get some interference to this electromagnetic field, and that's what these pipe trackers do. They they are reading this interference, and then they just make sure that they they are hooked up to the uh, the navigational system of the RV, so that usually you have an auto feature here, so you, you can put it to auto track, so that when the ROV is uh, has locked on to the pipeline, it's just going to follow it, so that if the pipeline turns this way, then the ROV is going to follow it. So you just uh, 
keep an eye on as, as the pilot. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the point of the height tracker. Then, of course, you will have a, a transponder uh, somewhere on the ROV. Uh, it depends a bit uh, how these work. Uh, some of the transponders listen for a signal from um, that moment. Uh, not really a transponder, basically, but, but some of the ROVs are designed to listen for a signal from the surface vessel and then send the return signal as soon as it receives, uh, receives the signal. So it will be listening to an acoustic signal from the surface vessel that's being sent through the water and down to it. And then as soon as it receives the acoustic signal, it's going to send through the umbilical an electrical signal. I, uh, I heard the acoustic signal at this exact uh, point in time. And then they can calculate more where. Uh, where uh, the ROV is in relation to the vessel, because then they will know the distance to the ROV. Uh, but some of them actually work uh, differently, where, where they actually are sending the acoustic signal from the ROV itself, and then it's the vessel that's receiving. And that's uh, what I've heard lately is that that's uh, a bit better way of doing it, because you get less interference, uh, because the, the acoustic signal coming from from other sources in order to, uh, to hit, the, uh, hit the ROV uh, can sometimes interfere in, in, uh, in some of the, with some of the sensors. So it's a bit better to send the signal from the ROV instead. <coughs> so that's just uh, one of the uh, parts there. Um, and also, we have stuff that's called spot scans. We're going to get into more of these different, uh, different sensors as we get along with more of each of them. Uh, so one of the tasks for the survey ROVs is to do pipeline surveys. Which is sort of uh, in their name. And what they're looking for when they're doing pipeline surveys is of course physical damage to, to the pipeline. They're also looking for the degree of covering so that if this pipeline is supposed to be covered by, uh, by rocks or sediment, that they injected sediment on top of it, just keeping it covered with regards to if it, this is a very active area with, uh, with trawlers and fishing and stuff like that. Maybe quite a lot of uh, ships drop anchor in this area uh, and they're afraid that uh, it's going to snag the pipeline. Uh, then they would want it uh, covered. Uh, and then they, of course, have to check every now and then that it is still covered because, as we've seen with the debris being moved quite long distances by ocean currents, that also goes for rocks and, and sediments. So, so, uh, the ocean currents can actually start uncovering uh, the pipeline. So even though it's supposed to be have a half a meter of uh, stuff on top of it, protecting it, you might suddenly get spots where there is nothing on top of it. It might even be, uh, be dug out from underneath it so that it's, uh, you have a free span there. And that's one of the other things that they're looking for, free spans of pipeline. Usually they have a minimum length, uh, a maximum length of a uh, free span. <coughs> So that the pipeline can handle, for example, eight meters of free span. That's not going to be, be a problem for, for the steel in the, in the pipeline. It's strong enough to handle it. But then if the uh, survey ROV uh, uncovers that some of these free spans, maybe 9, 10, 11, 12 meters, then you're starting to think that, well, you're starting to get elastic deformation in, in the pipeline, so it's basically sagging in the middle. And that's not good. So now we have to do something. We have to fill in uh, rocks or something underneath it just to uh, just to support it a bit. And if you get even longer free spans, uh, then you can risk that the elastic deformation is going to end up becoming a plastic deformation. And then you have then you're back at having actual physical damage uh, done to your done to your uh, pipeline, which is of course not good when you're running high pressure inside it, so any damage happening to it is going to be, be bad uh, in that case. And they're also looking for a physical obstruction, so both um, rocks that have fallen, from, uh, rock falls from, uh, you might have uh, hilltops nearby uh, on the water, and you might have rocks that are basically loosened by the ocean currents and they are going to fall down and might even damage the pipeline as they fall down. But you also have a huge problem, uh, especially in the European area, the European waters, is World War II mines. There was, 
if you start looking a bit at, at the numbers uh, well, with uh, regards to the amount of mines that were just dropped in the sea uh, during World War II, it's mind boggling. There's, there's so much metal and explosives that were just dumped in the sea, basically. So, so you're constantly uh, discovering new mines. We even have it here. Often the mines are uh, in uh, Orca, out on uh, Kami, uh, on the beach there. Uh, every year there's usually one or two mines that are uh, washed ashore there and uncovered. And then the army has to come in and uh, explode them. So, so it's... Uh, because that's basically the only thing you can do with a mine that's 60, 70 years old. You can just... You, you can't try to disarm it or anything like that because it's most likely going to blow up in your face. So you won't let any people near it, so you have experts that come in and they place explosives close to it and then you just blow up the entire stuff right? and you're free of it. Uh, but of course you can't blow a mine that's lying on top of your pipeline. That's going to be a huge problem. Uh, so what I know that's been done sometimes is that they've come in with work ROVs, so, so they've just marked the spots on the map where this mine is played, located, if it's very close, and they've come in with uh, ROVs and specialists and they usually try to remove it safely until, until they get it to a safe location where they can blow it up. So there's, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of work being done there. And I know the, the, Norwegian, uh, the Norwegian Navy, they have uh, projects going where they are going into the fjords and trying to clean up the fjords as much as they can. Because there's still, many of the fjords here in Norway are, are pretty deep and, there are, and there's quite a lot of mines that are hidden down at the, uh, at the bottom of the, those fjords. So trying to, to, to clean them up as much as possible. Uh, then we have the inspection ROVs. Run over here. And one thing I forgot to mention here, uh, it should have been a uh, uh, point here, which is of course to, to uh, should actually be not on the pipeline survey, but it is of course mapping the ocean floor. So, so before you place uh, the pipeline there at all, you want to want to have good maps to know where you're going to, to place your pipes and everything. So that's uh, one of the other uh, tasks of the survey ROVs. <coughs> so then we get to inspection ROVs, and these can be uh, quite quite different, uh, both in appearance and in, in uh, equipment. You have, um, I didn't have that one up, no. Uh, they uh, perform uh, inspections on uh, uh, quite a lot of stuff. So the submerged parts of rigs or floating vessels or anything, uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, just uh, throwing that in a diver, just to check the stuff that's only in a couple of meters deep on the other, it might be actually be easier to just throw in a, a, a um, an observation ROV, one that just has cameras, a small one. So just throw that one in there and you can do a visual inspection of, uh, of everything that's submerged on the rig. Uh, I know in uh, my, my father worked on ships uh, in the 50s, no, the 60s, uh, and then he worked uh, in quite a lot of ships. And they often had to do, do work where they uh, uh, he was basically a machinist, uh, but, but they have, had to help uh, with everything. So uh, sometimes they had to actually free dive with, with no diving or anything, just holding their breath and just going down and checking if there was any damage or anything uh, on me. And he's actually done that in the Mediterranean Ocean while they, they weren't uh, along the coastline or anything. So he's done it in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean where they were just lying in wait because there was a big, huge storm that was uh, moving across their path. So they were just waiting out the storm in, in calmer waters. And then he was tasked with just swimming down and uh, trying to see, uh, basically do a visual inspection uh, under, the, uh, under the ship. But uh, as he said, when he, when he started coming down there, and he just saw that beneath him everything was just completely black because the waters were so deep that you couldn't see anything. So everything was just absorbed by the water down there. And that, that was uh, pretty scary. <laughs> and I really I can really imagine that it was pretty scary because you're down there and you have no safety or anything and you're just looking straight into nothing. So uh, I think ROVs are a good thing. <laughs> that you can use ROVs for well, stuff like this. But, but of course, if you have a diver uh, up on the rig, um, it's easy to use a diver also. Uh, 
basically setting up an observation army and dropping it into the ocean is going to take more or less the same amount of time uh, for a diver to, to get its gear in order. So it's uh, going to be more or less the same thing. And I think we'll do a break before we continue on. Yeah, we were talking about uh, visual uh, inspection of the submerged parts of reefs. Uh, but sometimes you need more than a visual inspection because maybe your visual inspection has actually uh, uncovered something that you need to check more closely. Maybe you need to get down there with, uh, with uh, more specialized equipment, uh, do an ultrasound, look for cracks in the, in the, uh, the material, or maybe even do do uh, magnetic tracings and, and these uh, eddy currents. Uh, I think you did that in the lab with Helm in uh, your materials course, where you did these different kinds of uh, ways, the, the NDTs, non-destructive testing ways. The only one you basically didn't do was the X-ray one, which is the dangerous one. <coughs> Just as a small side note there, I, when I was uh, working for ABLE, uh, we were doing a, a, an upgrade project Closeness, which is outside of uh, Bergen, where you can actually look at, uh, at the, the tall platform. You can see in the top of the platform uh, out there, uh, and uh, that's basically just a, a processing plant, like like Costa is, but they only get gas. They don't get oil. In. They they get only gas in, and uh, they, um, uh, they they had to do NDTs with X-rays every now and then. And then they just basically shut off that entire section of the uh, of the plant. So no one except the people that were going to do the MDT tests were allowed in there. So usually the MDT tests were run at night because that's what the night shift was uh, had the fewest people uh, on on it. So it was basically just the the uh, the workers of the plant and themselves, the, the process uh, people that were running uh, the plant. So so the able guys uh, didn't didn't have a night shift. So then there was a lot less people. So when they were running the NDTs, they were running it uh, as night, uh, in the night time, and they were closing off entire sections of the plant, basically, because they were, they were going to bombard uh, parts of the pipeline with uh, X-rays, which everyone should know is very bad for you. <laughs> it can cause uh, quite a lot of cancer with, with that uh, X-ray radiation. That being said, we, uh, doing an X-ray with your doctor is not dangerous because you don't get, uh, get the uh, high amounts of dosages that you would get from, from uh, basically when they do these NDTs, they use uh, quite a lot, a lot more X-rays uh, than uh, a basic X-ray image uh, from a doctor. So it's, uh, it's a bit more dangerous and they also do it in a larger area, so, so that it's, uh, it's not, that, not that good to be close by. Yeah, so um, that's uh, another part then. After a general uh, inspection possibly has uncovered something, then you will have to go down with something more. Uh, maybe you even have to, since this will be, this will not be deeper than 100 meters, so you m might even have to uh, have to clean it quite a bit in order to, to be able to, to actually visually observe it uh, beforehand. And of course, uh, we do inspections on subsea production systems. Uh, and there is uh, more or less the same. Usually, you won't go down with uh, a pure observation ROV uh, because that one will most likely be down there helping a work ROV already. Uh, but uh, if you do a proper inspection on a subsea production system, you usually have uh, have an ROV that's a bit more equipped so that it has has uh, manipulators and has the possibility of cleaning uh, and, uh, and getting. Maybe it even has at least an ultrasound uh, equipment with it, so that it can do uh, an ultrasound directly if it's uh, if it uh, discovers something. If the ultrasound isn't good enough uh, to do it, then of course uh, you will have to look at other stuff. So, like the eddy current uh, uh, problem, basically then you're using magnets and you're using the, these um, iron particles that you are placing on top of. So when you're doing it in the lab, it's very easy because you can just sprinkle this powder on top of your uh, your workpiece, and then you can run the magnets on it, and then you will see see uh, the shapes of the uh, magnetic fields in the powder. But but how do you do that when everything is submerged in water? 
So, so it's a quite a lot uh, more difficult to do eddy currents on the water. It is possible to do it. So I think they use uh, some gel-like stuff. Uh, either that or it's a special kind of liquid uh, that they use uh, instead of using a powder. And uh, it's very difficult for an ROV to do this. There are some ROVs that can manage it. Uh, they have special equipment for, for doing it, but usually the eddy current stuff is done by divers. So um, it might be... I, I think probably as time passes, it's going to become more and more of this specialized RV equipment that's going to be able to, to handle it. Uh, but uh, at least at the time when this was written, the, the, the usual way was to use a diver if you had to use any current. But then, of course, you're restricted to certain depths, so you can't go deeper than 180 meters, at least in the, in the Norwegian parts of, uh, of the North Sea. Other parts of the world, they allow divers to go even deeper, but uh, it has its risks, of course. So uh, uh, it can be, you, you can get uh, basically a, equipment uh, obstacles. So, so the equipment itself will create obstacles for you and how to do stuff. And uh, inspections of anchoring points, and uh, basically the arrangements of floating uh, floating elements in the uh, in the uh, production system, basically the entire system. So that if you have a uh, if you have a floating offloading buoy, and that's basically just a floating uh, it's just a, a tower that's floating by itself. Where, where you can connect the tanker to it and you can offload the uh, oil uh, to it. Uh, so it's uh, inspecting those kinds of floaters, inspecting uh, floating vessels, and of course inspecting the anchoring points, just to make sure that the anchors uh, actually have a proper grip on, on the ocean floor, so that uh, you know that this is going to, it's going to stay here. Uh, not only that it has the proper grip on the ocean floor, but also that for example, uh, the connection between the anchoring chain, the mooring chain, and, and the anchor itself, that's nothing is uh, happening there. If you have uh, suddenly uh, a very serious corrosion uh, incident uh, on some part there, you might end up uh, snapping the, the chain if you get too much load on it. So it's uh, important to make sure that, uh, uh, that those are also inspected. And the rise systems between the, the floating parts of, uh, of the uh, system, uh, production system and the, the subsea parts. So from the subsea wells uh, or a manifold or something like that and going up to, uh, to the surface. So those, uh, those pipelines that are going up there, those also need to be, uh, be uh, inspected. And they, uh, they have to be inspected well also because those are the ones that are under, uh, under the most strain uh, when we are uh, producing everything because they're basically just hanging there. And they can get a lot of, uh, uh, they do get a lot of movement with regards to, uh, especially if it's a floating vessel and everything. So, so the vessel is going to move, and then you have these loops where they are uh, coiled into loops, basically, uh, the risers. And, but, but even though they are able to flex out these movements, they are still being flexed. And whenever you are, whenever you have a material where you are, over time, gradually flexing it. Over time, it's going to become weaker and weaker. And that's what we call fatigue. So, uh, Tobiel uh, will most likely uh, talk more about it in mechanical design with you, uh, about the fatigue stuff. But basically, it's the same as <coughs> if you have a piece of plastic and you want to, to break it off, uh, you don't have anything, you don't have a scissor or anything, you can't be able to cut it, then you can just start uh, bending it. And if you just keep on bending it, you're going to feel that it starts getting warm, and then uh, it's going to, um, it's black plastic, it's probably going to turn white uh, where you're bending it, and then suddenly it's just going to snap. And that's basically what fatigue is, that's a, a sped up version of it. So it's, that's going to happen with steel also, uh, but usually we're talking about like uh, several hundred thousand uh, flexes uh, or something, may maybe millions of flexes before, before it becomes a problem. But, but still, it might be a problem. So it's something that's uh, very important to, uh, to run inspections on uh, for those prices. And we have different categories uh, of the inspection RVs. 
So the first category is the general visual inspection. So those are the, the small ones with just the camera, maybe a small nip register to, to be able to clean a little bit. And category two is close visual inspection. Those are definitely equipped with a manipulator, you know, a manipulator maybe even two, and, and they usually have some sort of uh, cleaning equipment, a rotating brush or, or something uh, uh, that they can use to, to, to clean it properly. Maybe even they have some sort of grinding tool that they can actually grind away rusts uh, and, and get to get to the uh, the steel beneath so that they can see uh, blank steel uh, <clears throat> because then it's a lot easier to see if you have cracks uh, in the material uh, by visual inspection. Uh, and they often also use different kinds of cameras. Uh, so, for an example, if you have an opening in your structure, so this is one of Ivanko's cameras, and it's designed for, for if you have an opening of a certain diameter, this camera is going to fit inside, and then it can be rotated around here, you can see the, the seam there, so the tip can be rotated around that, and you can also pivot uh, this ball on the end. So basically, an ROV can just shove the camera inside a hole in the structure, and then you can get a 360 degree view inside. Uh, of the whole. So you can get uh, visual inspections inside parts of the structure also. So, so uh, that's a typical uh, typical equipment that a, a, a close visual inspection uh, RV would use. And then we have the third category which is a detailed inspection. And now we're getting into to, uh, now we're we really talking uh, heavy heavy equipment because now we need to, to do quite a lot. Uh, we might even have to dismantle parts uh, of the system in order to get get to see everything uh, properly. <clears throat> and of course, those are the the ROVs that use uh, use different uh, non-destructive testing, so such as ultrasound and the eddy current principle and uh, magnetic pulse. Uh, in order to get it, so, so uh, basically uh, the same as an MRI. If you have ever been in an MRI machine in a, in a hospital or, or seen one on TV or something like that, these huge machines where you place a person inside it and it's going to make a lot of noise and then it uh, creates uh, an, a 3D image of your entire body. It can, can do your entire body. And that's the same principle that they can use also for, for uh, non-destructive tests. Uh, here's an old inspection ROV, which was uh, an attempt made, actually Jens Christian, he, he was, uh, I can't quite remember if he, if he was part of the team developing this one, or if it was, uh, he was just uh, employed by the same company uh, back then, uh, when this one was uh, developed. But what, they, uh, what the purpose was then was basically to create an all-purpose inspection ROV. Uh, so basically all of these uh, stuff that's going out here, those are different kinds of non-destructive test equipment. So basically they equipped it with all kinds of testing equipment. And then uh, the point was that while submerged, the ROV could just reach with the manipulator in under itself and pull out the correct equipment and then they could do, do the uh, task. Which meant that once you had lowered the ROV down to, to the ocean floor, it wasn't necessary to, to pull it up again to equip it with an ultrasound equipment and then put it down again in order to do the ultrasound. And then pull it up again if you had to do an uh, eddy current or something. Because it already had everything on it. But I think the conclusion was back then that uh, basically this became way too expensive. So no, none of the companies were willing to pay that much money for one single ROV when it had all of this equipment on. So um, it didn't really become a huge success, uh, if I remember correctly, when he, when he told us about it. Um, so it's a, but, but it's a nice thing to see that what on paper looks like a very good idea it doesn't always work when you're trying to put it out into the real world. And that's all, all, often a problem for uh, startup companies uh, that are trying to, they have a really good idea so they start it up, but unless they do proper research first to check that 
everything is going to be received well, that everyone really wants this product, then most likely it, it, it won't be received all that well. And, and they won't make the money that they thought they were going to make. And they might even end up uh, bankrupt uh, in that startup company. So it's a, it's a it's quite a usual story to hear that, that someone had a good idea, but it didn't really pan out because no one was interested in it right then and there, but then maybe five, ten years later, someone has a similar idea and then suddenly people are interested in it. So it's, uh, it's a bit uh, difficult to, uh, to, uh, to be able to predict exactly how, how things are going to work. It's sort of the same with, uh, if, if you look at like, uh, Elon Musk and uh, the Teslas. So the guys that uh, created the first Tesla car, uh, that was before Elon Musk started investing in it, uh, and they just had a good idea, they wanted to create a really good electric car. Because at that point, all of the electric cars, they looked like crap. And they were really small and usually all plastic. It looked like you could tip them over it by pushing your finger uh, against the side of it. Uh, but they actually did uh, create a proper car. So, so they took a Lotus Elise, which is a sports car, and they just stripped it completely, pulled out the engine and everything, and then they started putting in batteries and uh, electrical uh, motors, and started creating uh, the first Tesla for this one. And Elon Musk heard about this, and he figured that, well, this is something that's going to work. He was really sure that this is going to work, this is going to take off, so I'm going to put my money in with these guys. And if, if there hadn't been an Elon Musk at that point, who, were, who was willing to, to put all of that money in, I don't think, Tesla would have been a thing, so, so it wouldn't have happened, basically. So if it hadn't been for his money and his support in, in the beginning, that he was willing to use money on it, then nothing would have happened with that startup, basically. So, so it uh, sort of shows a bit, you, you really need to, 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 to pitch your ideas to the right people when, you're, when you have a good idea. Excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, the, the eddy current principle is uh, basically you have um, see, I have this one. You have magnets. Uh, you have a workpiece that it only works if you have a magnetic workpiece. So, so it, it has to be made out of steel or or some kind of metal that um, that is uh, magnetic. So if you have a workpiece, and it might be that you have uh, you can't see it, but somewhere inside the workpiece. You have either an impurity in the material, or maybe you actually have an internal crack in the material, so that it's a bit weaker in that spot. And then you can basically, when you're on land, then you, you can sprinkle dust, magnetic dust, on top of the workpiece, and then you put uh, put magnets on. So you magnetize the workpiece. Uh, and then you're going to get uh, these uh, sort of uh, patterns on top in the uh, in the, uh, the magnetic uh, dust that you put on top there. But the thing is that that pattern is going to basically follow. Uh, so if we're looking at this one from the top, I can't uh, do this uh, from the top of my head. But the pattern is basically going to follow the, the magnetic uh, the magnetic field that magnet is creating through the material. And the dust is going to arrange itself according to that field. So the dust is going to, 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 to place itself so that you're actually going to see the lines of the field of, of the magnet. But the thing is, this crack in here is going to create sort of a, a dip in the magnetic field. So that then you can see where the field isn't uh, a nice, even magnetic field, uh, you're, you're getting some sort of interference uh, with the dust, that's where you have something that's going on inside the material. It's just basically just disturbing the magnetic field so that you're, you're getting the, uh, the, uh, the uh, stuff from it. Uh, you get to see where it is, uh, basically. <coughs> um, uh, was, it, was it good enough, or no? no. <laughs> uh, I, I would advise you to, to, to look in your uh, your uh, materials uh, book stuff because that's where it's really decently explained. I'm just doing this from the top of my head now, so I'm, uh, uh, I haven't uh, 
looked into how to explain this properly. Uh, not uh, really one of my uh, my uh, fields where I've worked a lot, so I don't have that much experience with it myself. <coughs> uh, uh, one of the ways uh, that they can do inspections uh, on equipment is to basically place uh, the equipment across, for example, in this case, this looks like the framework of a rig. Uh, so this is a jacked up rig, most likely, that's uh, placed on the ocean floor. And uh, they are now starting to check, uh, check these pipes that make up the framework for it. And then they have this, uh, basically a hinged uh, sensor so that you, you can open it up and then you can place it across the pipe and then you, you can snap it shut so that you get sensors all the way around the pipe. And then they can run, whether it's ultrasound or x-rays or anything, so they can run equipment all the way around the pipe and then they get a good, good view of, uh, of it. Uh, so they get good images of the internal structure. And basically, if you want to be completely sure uh, of the structure when you're doing an inspection, you're going to do as much as you can of these inspections. You're going to inspect the entire length of every single pipe. But that's not really, that's not really time efficient. It's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and basically, by the time you're done doing all of the pipes, you have to start over again because you have used up so much time doing all of the, uh, all of the structure. So that's why they use the, the visual inspections first off to check to see if there are uh, areas where they are unsure if they are uh, good enough. And then they go to these areas that they are unsure of. And then they run these tests on those areas. So it's basically a sort of elimination strategy with the, with the uh, vis visual observations. It's basically just to, to eliminate the areas where you feel pretty confident that nothing has gone wrong in this connection. Uh, and here we can see a, uh, I think this is an ultrasound image uh, from uh, something uh, more or less like this one. So they run ultrasounds all the way across it. And here we can see that this part here, it looks like there might be something uh, going on there. But since this is uh, showing up so strongly and it's going in a straight line like this, this is most likely the, the welding point because this is this is a huge pipe, so it's been made out of a sheet of metal, basically a plate of metal that's been uh, rolled until it uh, becomes more like a pipe, and then it's been welded. Uh, there's a welding seam going along the entire pipe there. So that means that this is really a problem, and that's the weld, and the welding material is usually stronger than, than the uh, material of the pipe itself, so that that's uh, not really going to be a problem. But also the welding material, since it is stronger, it has different properties than the rest of the uh, rest of the material. So that's why it's showing up differently than, than the rest of it. But you can see up here, here well, there's something up here that doesn't look all that good. We have bright spots up there also. So there is something is happening up top there. And most likely, if this is a if this is a flow line. Uh, it might be that uh, we have a multi-phase going through it, so we both have wet liquid and we also have gas going through it. Because then, most likely, uh, the liquid will be down here, filling up most of the pipe, and then you have gas up top. Which means that there might be more corrosion up there, but we're not quite sure what's happening in there. So this is most likely internal uh, corrosion, so, so it's a bit weaker on the inside. And then the point is for, for the inspection, uh, for the inspection engineers, the guys that are uh, evaluating the results here, they have to basically sit down and look at it. Is this something that we have to do something about? Do, do, do we do we need to uh, look very close at this? Do we need to think about maybe shutting down the pipe and, uh, and uh, cutting out this section of pipeline and putting in a new one? Just to make sure that it's not going to be too weak, so that we're going to have a rupturing when we run that full pressure. But basically, if you're working like that, uh, that is a job where a mechanical engineer can come into it. But I would guess that most likely you've done a, a, a master's degree in materials or something like that. So, so you would have you would 
have quite a lot of knowledge on how to interpret this kind of thing. Either that or you've done a lot of courses uh, uh, that you've gotten from your uh, employer or something like that. So it's uh, because also uh, just interpreting an image like this, it depends a lot on, on the equipment that's created the image also. So you have to know how this equipment creates its images and everything. So it's difficult to just get a view like this and say that mm -hmm. there's some corrosion up here, we have to do something about it. So that's practically impossible. You have to you have to know the sensory equipment and you have to know what kind of method has been used and you have to know the materials and everything and the thickness of the walls. So all of that needs to be known before you can start uh, judging uh, potential damage here. So then we're going to look at uh, further developments in uh, the ROV world. I think we'll manage to do this before we're done for today. So there are some problems with current ROVs. And the most common one is electrical system failures. So basically grounding faults where you, you end up getting uh, either seawater penetration into somewhere where you can't have it, where you end up grounding you know, all of your electrical circuits and getting blackouts. Or it might just be that you, you, you end up damaging your umbilical uh, and you're uh, ripping, uh, rip, breaking some of the wires in there so that you, you don't get contact with it. Um, so th there's a lot of ways that this can happen, but usually we're talking about water penetrating into the electrical system so that then it's uh, short circuiting. Uh, and that can often happen uh, at the cable termination and couplings. So at, at the point where, where the cable ends and you've terminated it into a coupling, so whether it's a male or a female coupling, but then also between the male and female coupling when you're putting the cable uh, into place. So it might all be fine up on the vessel when you're connecting it together, but then when you're lowering it into water and it gets deep enough, to, if there is air bubbles inside there or something, there might be there might be uh, water penetrating in because then all of the pressure is going to compress the air in there, and then there's going to be room for the water to to, to get in there. <coughs> and also grounding faults, uh, as I talked about, and water penetration. So that's more into specifically into the bottles and containers that are uh, that are keeping the the uh, electronics in in basically uh, regular atmosphere. Usually they don't have they don't have regular air inside them because regular air also has moisture in it, and that's uh, most likely going to end up as uh, as uh, not not as uh, uh, what's Steam, but yeah, you get condensation. So, so if you have regular air that you trap inside bottles uh, and containers of electronics, you have moisture with it because all of the air we have around us has uh, air humidity. Uh, and then when you're lowering it down, it's going to get colder. So and as it gets colder, this moisture is going to condense and then you're going to get uh, droplets of water inside your, uh, your electronics bottle. And that's not good because then you can have water uh, dripping onto your uh, circuits and everything, and it's going to uh, make a lot of problems. So usually they are filled with either CO2 or nitrogen. The most common one is, is nitrogen, uh, but I've seen uh, CO2 in use also. Um, and basically, just, just a very quick way of doing that is they they're usually shaped more or less like a bottle, so that they have uh, look like a gas tank, basically with opening in one end. So what they end up doing is that they open the end, they have uh, put all of the electronics equipment in there, and then before they put the lid on and close it off, then they basically just do nitrogen or uh, carbon dioxide, and they just fill it up. Because nitrogen and carbon dioxide are denser than regular air, so it's going to fill up inside the bottle, and after a while it's going to spill over the sides. You can't see it or anything, but it's going to spill over the sides and the air is not going to be able to penetrate down there. So then when you put the lid on, it's going to be basically basically one, uh, one gas in there. And there are also other ways of doing it where you can put the, put the bottle inside a, a, a 
working container where you have these gloves that are connected to, to the walls of the container so that you can stick your hands into the, in, into the gloves and then you can actually manipulate stuff. And then inside this container there would be just nitrogen gas or something. So that's no matter how you put the lid on, if you keep it upside down and put the lid on, there's just going to be nitrogen gas in. So there are different ways of doing this, but uh, the, the easy one is just keeping it straight up and filling it with the gas. We also have uh, problems with hydraulic system failures. And uh, it can be pipes and hoses uh, and their connections uh, that due to vibrations they end up being open. So, so since we do, we, we will get vibrations everywhere in, in the ROV as it's working. We have systems running, we have pumps, uh, hydraulic pumps running, we have motors, everything, the thrusters are running. So, so there, and there's a lot of uh, stuff that's uh, creating vibrations. And uh, that means that stuff is going to move. And unless you have managed to tighten uh, tighten these couplings correctly, so you use the correct amount of momentum as you are uh, tightening them, then they can basically just un loosen themselves uh, as they are uh, as they are being vibrated. And then you would of course get get uh, an open connection there. You would have hydraulic fluid spilling into uh, into the ocean, and you would have ocean water penetrating into your hydraulic system. So that's a big problem. And uh, of course, you can have valves and pumps failing while you're uh, subsea. So and that can be any kind of reason. Uh, maybe it was about time to do a service on it or something. Maybe you've been running it very roughly so, so that uh, you've been, you've been uh, basically mishandling it, forcing, uh, forcing it to operate in ways that it shouldn't operate. Maybe uh, the pump had been forced to run at very high pressure higher than normal operating pressure for a while and then that it's most likely going to break sooner or later. Um, and valve faults, that could be anything. That could be contamination in your system that basically blocks the valves from uh, opening and closing properly. It can be many different uh, things. And also, in general, the water penetration into the hydraulic fluid. Uh, because, of course, water doesn't lubricate quite as well as uh, the hydraulic fluid does. And as we've seen when we've looked at valves uh, in the hydraulic systems and also at pumps and motors and everything, we really need the hydraulic fluid to lubricate parts uh, of the hydraulic system. So that's what we, we set it up uh, in such a way that we have these leakage oils in, in, uh, in critical areas so, so that we get the proper lubrication. But if you get too high of a water content then in your hydraulic fluid, you won't get uh, the proper lubrication for it. And uh, that's also going to cause problems with corrosion with having, having water uh, inside, the, inside the hydraulic system. There are also operational problems. Uh, those are, it, it can be many things, but, but for example, uh, if the ROV pilot uh, isn't at all times aware of where his umbilical is, he can snag the umbilical on parts of the subsea structure and basically just get completely stuck. And then another ROV will have to come down there and uh, help help the first ROV unstuck. Or, in the worst case, uh, the other ROV has to actually just cut the umbilical so that they can free the free the other ROV. And that's uh, that's suddenly starting uh, to create quite a lot of problems if you have to cut the umbilical because then you have to. Do a lot of preparation work when you, when you get everything up up to the surface level. Uh, so that, that's just one type of operational problem uh, that you might have. Uh, you might have signal problems, uh, so that suddenly one of your screens goes blank. So one of your cameras stops working. You can't really see what you're doing. So maybe uh, if you have two or three cameras, the main camera, the one that's looking straight at what you're doing, that one goes button black. That is not really much. You can see what's happening on your sides, but you can't really see what you're doing with your hip legs. So it's a, there's quite a lot of operational problems that can that can happen. Um, and I think basically, if you if you are creative enough to to, to think of uh, a situation where something can happen, it's probably already happened or uh, will happen sometime. Uh, so it's uh, anything can can happen when you're working like that. So the the work. 
Ford in the ROE industry at least is is trying to to increase the reliability of the ROEs and, and also the availability because availability now is uh, very reduced with regards to weather uh, so that you don't you can't really operate if you have too high waves you won't be able to launch your RV you will have problems operating uh, the RV and, and uh, getting it back into recovering it uh, back to your vessel is also going to be a problem with too high waves uh, if the waves get very uh, very large it's going to be impossible to do anything with the RV so, so that's where the availability part comes in that uh, trying to increase the amount of weather that uh, that you can handle with a system and the reliability is of course try to, to reduce the, the kinds of problems that we've just been looking at so <coughs> one of the ways of doing this is to increasing the quality of all of the components basically just making them uh, subsea worthy because quite a lot of the components that are being used nowadays are regular components that you would use on land in a land based system and then you just uh, tweak it a bit to get it to work uh, on the water like for an example uh, the, uh, the uh, cylinders that are used the, the usually they just use completely regular cylinders uh, hydraulic cylinders and just make them out of stainless steel instead of regular steel so it's just, just one of those uh, differences that only helps with corrosion. You, don't, you haven't made any any uh, design changes or anything like that to, to account for for uh, being submerged in quite a lot of hydrostatic pressure. So, so it's uh, just uh, trying to, to to create components that are made to work on the water instead of uh, modifying already uh, created components to to sort of work on the water. That's one of the, the ways of being able to do this. And also making sure that we have redundancy. So that if we have a uh, possibility, and if we have a problem with a hydraulic pump, say, uh, on an ROE, that the, uh, often on this kind of ROE, the pump is going to, to fail. Well, if we then make sure that we have a backup pump, then at least we're going to be able to finish doing the job that we were doing when, when the uh, pump uh, broke down. Because then we'll just be running on the backup pump. And then when we uh, get the, the ROV back up again, we can fix uh, the, uh, the main pump. So, so it's uh, stuff like that, getting different kinds of backup systems. But the thing is, you can't, you can't back up everything. So not everything can have a redundancy scheme, because some things are fairly reliable. They, they usually never break. And having a redundancy uh, part for that one then is not really it's not really worthwhile. It's going to increase weight and cost and everything. And they are also trying to eliminate the hydraulics and basically going fully electric on, on the RVs. And I know that some companies have uh, fully electric uh, work RVs uh, out there, uh, but again, it's the problem with the oil and gas industry being conservative, so they don't really trust it quite yet, so, so they, don't to, they don't want to try it. So until people give it uh, a proper chance and uh, use them properly, then I don't think there's going, it, it's not going to take off properly until, until they, get, they get the chance. But I do think that is the way to go, uh, to eliminate the hydraulics uh, on the subsea systems and go for, go for fully electric ROVs. And um, yeah, uh, basically having the people working with the RVs better trained, so, so that they know more of what they're doing, uh, and that's being done quite a lot of already. So, so now, nowadays uh, we have uh, like the the SimC facility over here. They they are doing uh, doing uh, simulator trainings uh, with the RV pilots, so that before they are uh, let set free and get to work with proper RVs, they do simulator training. So they're basically playing video games to learn how to how to operate the RVs properly. So, so uh, a lot of this is, uh, I think this is one of the places where, where there has been done the most in, in recent years. So, so ma making sure that the people working with it are, are better trained. So other problems, 
uh, we need to manage to transfer uh, transfer enough energy yeah, uh, from from the vessel and down to the ARV. So that's going to be a larger problem if we are eliminating hydraulics and going fully electric, because then we need to get all of the energy down there in the form of uh, electric current. So uh, so that's going to that's going to be more of a problem. Uh, now we can have some electric current, and we have the rest uh, being uh, being uh, uh, either uh, transferred directly down by uh, as hydraulics, or we are running electric current, and then we are running a hydraulic pump down there. So it depends a bit on how the system is. But the more and more tasks that they are, we are supposed to do, then the more energy they need to, to be able to do them. So so it's uh, going to be be uh, difficult to well not difficult, but it's going to be a challenge to to, to manage to create systems like that. Uh, yeah, because then we will get we will get a thicker RV cable, and it's going to be more subjected to ocean currents, and this is going to affect the RV. And also, it's going to affect uh, the ability to lift heavy loads because if you get a thicker uh, umbilical cable, uh, it also weighs more, mm -hmm. and that takes up some of the total weight that you can can lift with the system. Yeah, we'll stop there and uh, we'll look at development of electrical RVs uh, next week.